But let's turn to the blockbuster announcement, uh, which kind of a interesting mixed bag. You want to tell us a little bit about, uh, and before you get into it, if you go to Catholic Family News uh, website, you can read the full text of Archbishop Vigano's statement, which we have available there. Yes, and this came as a bit of a surprise, I will say. Uh, last week we were talking about um, some questions that were raised regarding Archbishop Vigano's initial statement regarding the accusation of schism that was made against him, and now he's come out with a longer statement. And some you will see this statement be titled different in different ways. You now it's being usually uh, titled as "I accuse." Um, or, or it's it's in some sense accusing either Pope Francis or the Second Vatican Council. Of course, there is an allusion there to I accuse the council from Archbishop Lefebvre. Now, the statement itself, there's a lot of there's a lot of good, a lot of that we're going to agree with, right? There's going to be the, there's an obvious disconnect with the post conciliar church, the conciliar church, and the church of the pre conciliar period a lot that we're going to agree. We're going to agree with the basic assessment made in the book of Iota Unum, an excellent work there, and that there is a disconnect indeed. But Archbishop Vigano does take his own position that he aims to defend. And I'll, we'll start with, I, I think, is the thesis of his position that he gives at the top. He says, or at least accompanying the work. He says, before my brothers in the episcopate and the entire ecclesial body, I accuse Jorge Mario Bergoglio of heresy and schism. And I ask that he be judged as a heretic and schismatic and removed from the throne, which he has unworthily occupied for over 11 years. Now that's a serious accusation, right? Of course, that's a, um, a, a major statement there. And, Firstly, we need to go into understanding that we agree with a lot of his basic assessment of the church. We need to go for his reasoning behind uh, this declaration of uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio is not the pope, that Pope Francis is not the successor of St. Peter. And I'll pull up a section here that I think is the most important. It basically puts all of the argument into one place. And reading the whole thing, because I think it's necessary that we, we go over his actual statement, he says, A schismatic sect accuses me of schism. This should be enough to demonstrate the subversion taking place. Imagine what impartiality of judgment a judge will be able to exercise when he depends on the one whom I accuse of being a usurper. But precisely because this event is emblematic, I want the faithful, who are not required to be familiar with the functioning of the ecclesiastical tribunals, to understand that the crime of schism is not connected, committed excuse me, when there are well-founded reasons to consider the election of the Pope as dubious, due both to, to the vit consensus, as well as the irregularities or violations of the norms which govern the conclave. He gives a citation there. Uh, quick things to recognize before we move on. That uh, Latin phrase there, the defect of consent, is a reference also to a conference that he gave in the Catholic identity at the Catholic Identity Conference. And well, actually, so that he, he by, didn't that he didn't give. He wasn't allowed to give it. He probably was supposed to give it, but then he published it afterwards because he was. Well, oh yes, know. yes. Yeah. It was a but yeah. a statement, in, I suppose, in yeah. connection with it. Yeah. Um. Uh, but yes, you're right. Um. Secondly, his his general statement here that it is their their accusation of schism i would say is generally correct and i think we need to make this distinction here when we talk about schism we're typically talking about something known as formal contempt and formal contempt can come into play when it's just a dis a not a mere disrespect but a disregard entirely of the source of authority and so in political terms we would call this as treason for example um and if we're talking in uh, in terms of the faith, we would call this apostasy. And if we're talking in terms of ecclesial governance, we're now talking about schism. And that would require someone saying that the Holy Father, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome is not the source of jurisdiction or authority in the church. Somebody that is a willful Eastern Orthodox, we would say does, uh, it, it would seem, we, don't, we can't read their conscience, but at least in act is making that declaration. It, I do not think anybody could say that Archbishop Vigano is saying that, that the Bishop of Rome is not um, the, the source of authority. Um, no, now, I, the before you go, yeah, before go on, I think that's a really an important point because 
whether you agree with what Vigo is going to come to next or not, it really doesn't matter because whether he's right or wrong, what he is saying does not constitute schism because schism, and that's really, is really recognizing in principle or arguing in principle, no Pope, regardless of their identity, possesses the power and jurisdiction that the church says that the Pope does and refusing obedience for that reason. And that's very different from saying, again, rightly or wrongly, factually, you may be right or wrong. This individual is not actually in the office, right? That's not Mm -hmm. actually schism. That is an argument about a fact related to the identity of who is the Pope. So, you know, for example, you know, other people who have taken so-called state of a contest positions I may disagree with them, but I would never say that most of them, again, I, I like Chris Ferrara says, you met one state of a contest, you met one state of a contest, because <laughs> it's hard to generalize. But most of them, you know, certainly don't reject the papacy at, on principle. And we always have to remember in the Great Western Schism, there was great confusion over who was the Pope. And there were saints, St. Saint Catherine of Siena and Vincent Ferrer, who disagreed about who was the Pope. One of them was right, one of them was wrong, but nobody accused those saints of being schismatic. So I think to this point, what Vigano says is very important when he says, just because I'm saying there's something wrong with this election doesn't mean that he is actually committing anything close to the sin uh, or the delect of of schism. To, I liked your political analysis. It will lead to our next story a little bit, or our third story. It's a little bit similar, analogous, if you're having your, you think this is theological, can't my mind around it. Think about the 2020 election. So it's, it's like the difference of saying, I don't accept the U.S. Constitution. I don't think the, the president has power. I don't accept Joe Biden because I think it's an illegitimate country. As opposed to someone saying, I think there was fraud going on and the results of the election as reported, I don't think are factually correct. Right Now, again, that, that claim may be right or may be wrong. It, it may be factually true or not, but it's substantively different from the prior claim about, you know, I don't think the president has any authority in the country. And that's an important point, because even if you think Vigano is wrong about Jorge Bergoglio being being pope, it, it, this tribunal should not be able to convict him of schism on the basis of what he said. Yeah. And a quick uh, clarification as as well. Yeah. Uh, you'll sometimes hear in regards to the Western schism, the term material schism being used. I used that term um, last week. And what that's really referring to, it's an analogous term, uh, yes. it, similar to what you were saying, in in speaking that there is a break of some sort. It does not yes. mean that the, the, the formal crime of schism has been uh, committed. A final note before moving to the, his major claim that backs this up is he does talk about the irregularity irregularities and violations of the conclave, which is a substantial part of his argument. However, just like his accusations of Pope Francis regarding actions similar to covering up Cardinal McCarrick, etc., that we've covered on this show, his accusations, I think that needs more uh, substance behind it. I would like to have seen um, more substance there. However, let's move into the main uh, substance of his argument. The bull cum ex apostolatus officio of Paul IV established in perpetuity the nullity of a nomination or election of any prelate, including the Pope, who had fallen into heresy before his promotion to cardinal or elevation to Roman pontiff. It defines the promotion or elevation as nulla irata et in, in, in anis, void, invalid, and without any value. Begin, quote, even if it took place with the agreement and unanimous consent of all the cardinals, nor can it be said that it is validated by the receipt of the office, uh, consecration or possession, ellipsis, or by the putative enthronement, ellipsis again, of the Roman pontiff, etc., etc. I, I won't read that whole quote. You can read it for yourself there. The, um, the, the document and the claim that is typically used in the way Vigano is using this is to say that if somebody is a heretic, Prior to receiving the office of Pope, due to this papal bull, one cannot become Pope. The election would be invalid, even if there's unanimous consent. And I'll get into a few things uh, before we uh, regarding this, but he ends with saying, For this reason, with serenity of conscience, I maintain that the errors of, and heresies to which Bergoglio adhered before, during, and after his election, along with the intention he held in his apparent acceptance of the papacy, render his elevation to the throne null and void. Now, 
where to get into the the problem with this, what I would say I have an issue with, this argument is an argument used by set of a contest. It's a set of a contest argument that is um, it really has origins even looking back forty years ago. You might even find it in the seventies, um, and largely this argument has be, been abandoned, and I'll explain why. I'm going to pull up on a, sh a screen here a graphic that I'm uh, I made for explaining this, which give me just a moment. Here we are. So the debate regarding this issue has to do with what cum ex apostolatus is. Now, when we look at a papal bull or a papal document that's talking about law, there's two types of law. The first is divine positive law. This is revelation, right? This is the Ten Commandments, Nicene Creed, dogmas of the faith, or it, one can also say the substance of the liturgy. Secondly is what we call ecclesiastical law. Now, this is discipline. This would be something like fasting and abstinence reg regulations, papal conclave rules, accidental aspects of the liturgy, like, for example, adding a name into the Roman canon, adding the pater noster, uh, slight changes that we see through the organic development of the traditional mass, and finally, just canonical procedures. The debate regarding cum ex apostolatus is what does that bull fall under? Now, a set of a contest will say that this falls under divine positive law. A recognize and resist position, will, uh, somebody who adheres to that position, will say that it goes under ecclesiastical law. One of the reasons for this is because in 1945, the another apostolic constitution of the same doctrinal weight called the Cantis Apostolice Sedis, uh, produced by Pope Pius XII, really just contradicted this and said specifically, none of the cardinals may, by pretext or reason of any excommunication, suspension or interdict whatsoever or of any other ecclesiastical impediment be excluded from the active and passive election of the supreme pontiff now set of a contest are of course going to dispute this they will say that cum ex apostolatus the principle involved is divine positive law but the the final point that i'll wrap this up with is saying this is an extremely complex issue, and it's been disputed by many. I can give the example of Sodalitium, which was a set of a contest journal, I believe it's still operating, which said that this is a, an argument that really shouldn't be used. It's complicated. This is very disputed. And so what I do want to ask the, our, our audience, and I'll ask the faithful, and something that I, I keep in my, my own heart, is I do not think that this argument produces the moral certitude to be able to make such a grave accusation that Pope Francis is not the Pope, and that going by uh, Vigano's other statements, that we should sever communion. He says, no Catholic of the good name can be in communion with the Bergoglian Church. That's an, imp an imperative that we should sever communion, and that anybody who doesn't isn't a Catholic. I'm not convinced by that argument. Look, set of a contest have great arguments, and I have great, I have a good friends who are a set of a contest. I think they make great uh, great arguments in certain regards. Every position has weaknesses and strengths. This is not a strong position, uh, and that so that's my initial reaction. Not even getting into the contradictions, but um, Brian, what do you think about what do you make of the the primary argument, the substance of the argument of Archbishop Vigano here? Yeah, there there are two things about it. One is something that I found very interesting because there's sort of two major ways someone can go with this claim about Pope Francis. One is. All the popes up through Benedict XVI were perfectly fine. Vatican II may have some issues, but essentially, you know, it just needs to be a little clarified, but there's nothing dangerous to the faith in it. The new mass, if maybe aesthetically inferior, is still valid and legitimate, but uh, Bergoglio has gone too far. And he is, there's either, there's defects that, you know, the argument that you know, makes about defects in the conclave, et cetera, or he has tried to alter the faith, he's become a heretic, and you go down that route. Or the other alternative is the kind of what I call the classic state of a contest argument, which no one since Pius XII's death has held the papal see because, again, summarizing their argument, the council was was error errors, the post-conciliar magisterium contains errors, the church can never err, so none of these people were pope. But what's interesting about Vigano is he kind of straddles both, right? He tries, he 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 plays the Bergoglio arguments, and 
look, I, I think he's got some valid factual points that I just don't think we or even he in and of himself as an individual bishop is competent to make a definitive judgment about. He just says there's some questions here, right? Again, my analogy of the 2020 election, there's some smoke, there's some stuff that looks fishy. We need an official you know, investigation of the church. But he then makes the leap with those that Bergoglio is not the pope. But then he also basically is really clear throughout the document, because a lot of the things we didn't show is a, I mean, something, parts of it could have been written by our Marcel Lefebvre or the current priest of the Society of St. Pius X about Vatican II, about the post-conciliar era, about the liturgy. And he sort of maybe goes a little further on some of those and says, you know, that I, I reject them. I, I don't accept them. And they are a break with the church. They're a rupture. But that would lead to, again, every pope from... John the 23rd through Benedict the 16th, if you're going to be consistent. And he doesn't go there. I mean, he kind of brings you to the brink, but then doesn't take that step with them, doesn't refer to any of them as non-popes or anti-popes. So I'm left a little, I mean, I think he's now on record. He doesn't think Bergoglio is the Pope. He has skirted it. He sort of suggested it, but he's, 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 I think, crossed the Rubicon on that one. As to the other popes, I think he's still a little ambiguous on what he actually thinks. So that's the first observation. Secondly, I, I just like to make clear, look, I don't judge anyone in this issue. I, I like you, know a lot of people who you know, are various stripes of St. Vacantism. And, uh, you know, I had a long three, four hour video conversation with um, one of them, um, uh, Louis Varecchio, you watch on our channel. And, uh, I, you know, I don't, I, I think like you, they, there's a lot of things they say that are, are very valid and said some good things. I don't agree with everything, but I don't judge them. I mean, I don't say no, no. to them, well, obviously you're going to go to hell because you didn't think that John Paul II was the Pope or whoever. Uh, I, I think that, you know, these are not people, even if I think they're wrong on some things theologically or factually, various points, are not breaking with the church. They are not rejecting the Catholic Church. They are not schismatics. They are not rejecting a defined dogma of the church. Uh, and therefore, I think anyone who just sort of says, well, they're St. Vacantes, they're going to hell, they're outside the church, is wrong. I, I, I think we are in a, as Bishop Filet calls it, a great mystery. And exactly what's going on and what this all means, I think we just have to be patient. I think God is asking us to exercise the virtue of patience and say, and to st stay our curiosity. I mean, one of the things social media has done is we're obsessed with curiosity. We have to know. We have to get the answers. I think God is saying, you know what you need to know, the faith, the liturgy. As to the details of what's been going on since 1962, you may have to wait. We may have to wait till the end of the world, to the final judgment, to know all of it. And I think we just have to be very cautious. So I don't I don't think, whatever I disagree with in Vigo's statement or his approach, I don't think it, this tribunal is clearly going to condemn him. Um, and impose penalties. I don't think they're justified, um, not necessarily because of the arguments he's making, but because they don't constitute heresy or schism. Uh, certainly not heresy. Um, but I, you know, I did. I disagree. I don't think even a single bishop can definitively declare these things. I don't really know what that process would be, but I know it's got to involve the hierarchy as a unit, as a moral unity. Um, and I, 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 you know, I have great sympathy for him. I think he's been on an incredible journey uh, of touched by grace. We learned a little bit more about that in this statement. He's talked about it before, but you know, a lot of people said, you know, how did he, he seems like he changed a lot in 2019, 2020. I think it was a much longer process. He gives us, he lifts the veil a little bit here. I think it goes back to when he was the head of the gubernature of the, the, the Holy See. He saw this moral corruption, financial and other moral. And I think that led him to be open to grace, to say something's wrong here and, and to not cut off what a lot of people in the church do. Oh, there's a problem, but I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to Vatican II. I don't want to go to the new mass. But he was open to that. And he has progressed to see things for the way they are. And I think that is a great sign that he has been touched by grace. And he has also had the courage, unlike other bishops who I think have gone certain way down that path, but just can't take the leap. They can't, they can't, actually dot the I and cross the T. They want to reconcile it, create a com continuity. We can have our cake and eat it too. And I think he has great fortitude to say, you know, no, I don't accept Vatican II. I won't say the new mass. And uh, I'm not going to condemn him for what he said in this, even though I agree with you. I think some of his arguments are, are 
not the greatest. Um, I think the safer, I'm a conservative person by nature, right? I'm a lawyer, risk averse. As I've always said, I think the safest position is to treat the people in the offices as if they're holding the office, at least materially. Don't follow them when they do something wrong recognize and resist, if you want to call it that, uh, that that's the safer position than saying you must break communion with these people. Because I, I don't think we can tell anybody that. I think that it's too murky of a water and God in his good time will tell us. And I think my biggest problem, I think the biggest flaw of a sadist vacantist position is that I want to know all the answers. I want to have definitive knowledge of who and who wasn't the Pope, what counts, what doesn't. And I really do believe, I think some of it is God is just saying, you know what, you may not have to know. And that's the temptation of our time to get through this, to have patience and, you know, wait to the time when God is ready to say, OK, let me tell you who was actually Pope now. But there's not going to be a pop quiz at the gates of heaven. Name all 260, however you think there are popes. And if you miss one, you go to hell. That's not the substance of the faith. If you believe, and I think this is the strength of Vigano's statement. He says, I believe all the dogmas of the faith. I believe I am attached to the papacy. I believe in apostolic succession. And so he is clearly Catholic, even if I think he may be mistaken on a couple of points. So that's my take. And I want to second your, and I really agree with everything yeah. you just said there. And I will say, I think we should not be so naive to think in this modern evil age, especially if we read somebody like the Dominican spirituality or Eastern spirituality, there's this great sense that sin darkens the intellect and even being around sin and, and having all of this sinful influence, it darkens our ability to understand. And I think when you combine that with the severe crisis, we're in the most confusing crisis that there's ever been. I'm not so um, illusioned to think that every one position in particular has all of the answers. I personally think every one of these positions has major difficulties. Now, personally, I think the the Society of St. Pius X's position, uh, not necessarily going into everything that they, they've ever done, but their position itself, the position of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, it's the most internally consistent and it's the one that actually has a vision for the future. Now, I'll, I'll second Brian's point. If we had, um, if Archbishop Vigano said, look, I have these concerns, here's what I think. Of course, in the interest of truth, I would feel obliged to make these concerns about the argument. However, the reason that I, I think that this needs to be explained. And the reason why we've seen the Society of St. Pius X, for example, distance themselves from Vigano is that statement that you have a moral imperative, or at least seemingly, maybe he just miss, um, he didn't communicate properly, but that moral imperative to sever communion with everyone involved with saying the Pope's name in mass, to me, that does go too far. However, like Brian said, I'm not in the position to say as the judge you, I'm more of a traditionalist. I'm more of a Catholic than you. But still, um, in, in for for the point of truth, these things do have to be addressed. The arguments have to be addressed. Um, if it's ecclesiastical law, our argument works. If it's a divine positive law, a set of a conscious argument yeah. work works. I, I mean, it just gets it, to me. It, it's too confusing. It's a disputed matter. I can't. I I doubt there is moral certitude certitude to be found there. So that's my position on it. Some good, some bad in the statement. No matter what, we have to pray for the church and pray for Archbishop Vigano. Absolutely. And look, if somebody said to me, here's your choice, you're going to be marooned on a desert island for the rest of your life, either with uh, Cardinal Blaise Supich or Archbishop Vigano, I'll take Vigano any day. So, you know, <laughs> right. notwithstanding any differences. So, 